Question oral, oral questions. The honourable member for Portage Lisker. Mr. Speaker, when allegations surfaced about General Vance, the Minister of Defence said multiple times that he was shocked to learn about them. Well, we know this isn't true because he'd known for three years and he did nothing. It's obvious the minister never intended to act on this misconduct and instead Liberals actually threaten members of the armed forces in order to keep them quiet. So the question is why? Why was the Minister of Defence more interested in protecting his battle buddy than the men and women of the Canadian Armed Forces? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I disagree with the members' assertions. I disagree with the testimony that Mr. Waldman provided to the committee and look forward to setting the record straight when my opportunity comes to uh, speak with the committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Portage Lisker. Mr. Speaker, you're either part of the investigation or you're part of the cover-up. There is no middle ground. This minister chose to turn a blind eye and he helped cover it up. I believe the Ombudsman, Mr. Speaker, when he said that he tried to show the minister evidence and the minister said, no, I don't want to see it. Rather than protecting the very men and women he was supposed to be serving, the minister was more concerned with optics and keeping dirty little secrets. Does the Minister of Defence realize he has failed to do his job, he has lost credibility. He has lost trust. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've said, any allegations that were ever brought forward were immediately put forward to the proper authorities. In fact, the very next day after informing me of the uh, concerns, the former Ombudsman was contacted by the Privy Council Office to begin an investigation. There was no evidence that the Ombudsman relayed this to the original com complaint, despite repeated follow-ups by senior officials. And as I stated, Mr. Speaker, I look forward for an opportunity to go speak at committee once again. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Portage Lisker. In November 2017, the Prime Minister said in an interview that when there are questions of sexual misconduct, many times Liberals know but say nothing. Well, it's 2021 and it's still happening. The Liberal Minister of Defence knew. He said nothing. Privy Council members knew. They said nothing. Liberal PMO staff knew and they apparently said nothing. Today, on International Women's Day, it would be nice if the Prime Minister would stop defending these Liberals who knew about these allegations and said and did nothing. Will he do that, Mr. Speaker? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we've stated, we have no tolerance for, for, uh, for misconduct. Mr. Speaker, also, no politician should ever be part of any type of investigation. When any time allegations were brought forward, Mr. Speaker, were always provided to the appropriate authorities so that an independent investigation can be uh, conducted, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Honourable the Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, three years ago, on the 1st of March 2018, the National Defence Ombudsman met with the Minister who said that the current uh, commander was the sub subject of a sexual harassment complaint. The Minister said that he only became aware of it, but he was contradicted by the Ombudsman. The Minister didn't even want to see the evidence. What a lack of courage and what an abdication of responsibility. Why did the Minister of Defence act in this dishonourable way? Mr. Speaker, I completely disagree with the member's uh, assertions here. Every, any time any allegations were ever brought to my attention, it was always brought forward. No politician should ever be part of an investigation. It should always be done independently. And that's why immediately that these allegations were brought forward to the Privy mm -hmm. Council Office so that the independent investigation could be conducted. I disagree with the testimony provided by the former Ombudsman, and I look forward to showing up the committee to set the record straight. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, what's incontestable is that for three years, the Minister and the Prime Minister were silent. For three years, they did absolutely nothing to solve the situation. And now today, the Prime Minister, what does he do? He defends his Minister and accuses the Ombudsman what a shameful attitude. How is it that a self-proclaimed feminist can deal with this sexual harassment case with so little courage? Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're not going to take any lessons from the opposition when it comes to our action uh, supporting gender rights. We were the first government 
where the prime minister appointed a 50 percent uh, cabinet in the, in the ministry of, of defense we actually brought forward the dec declaration of victims of rights mr speaker we have taken action when it comes to gender rights and will continue to do so and not take any lessons from the previous government thank you the honorable, the honorable member for saint jean mr speaker once again last week quebec and all the provinces asked the government to increase the health transfers. The Prime Minister replied that he would think about it, but only after the pandemic. How many times do we have to say it? We are in a public health crisis, so we need to invest in health. And we need to do it during the crisis, not after. There's a fire that needs to be put out. Everyone has understood that except the Liberals. When will they listen to reason and finally increase the transfers? Le ministre. The Honourable Minister. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At every step, we were there for the provinces and territories. Historic investments in provinces and territories pre-pandemic and, of course, during the pandemic. $19 billion in safe restart money, Mr. Speaker. $2 billion for safe schools, Mr. Speaker. Purchasing all the personal protective equipment, funding the purchase of uh, a vaccine acquisition, funding research, being there for long-term care outbreaks. We'll continue to be there for provinces and territories, Mr. Speaker, as we get through this pandemic together. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, this government claims to be feminist. Well, 82% of nursing staff are women, and the, the government is abandoning these women by refusing to increase health transfers. Essentially, the government has told them to make do, and now they're telling them to make do in the second wave as well. And as vaccines start coming in, it's the same women who are going to be doing the vaccinations. They're carrying the entire burden on their shoulders. When will the government finally recognize their sacrifices and help them by increasing the health transfers? Ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've said repeatedly, we'll be there for provinces and territories as we have been all along. In fact, when we talk about gender equality today, it's important to remember that not only did we support immediate responses in long-term care, support provinces and territories in the extraordinary expenses they faced as a result of the pandemic, but we also topped up the wages, Mr. Speaker, for provinces and territories, essential workers that are often women. Mr. Speaker, we have been there for provinces and territories before the pandemic, throughout this historic uh, health crisis, and we'll be there as we recover. The Honourable Deputy de Burnaby. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Merci. Ça prend. Thank you. It takes a lot of courage to file a sexual harassment complaint, but that is exactly what a woman in the Canadian Armed Forces did. That complaint landed in the office of the Minister of National Defence, but he did nothing. What will the Prime Minister do to protect women in the Canadian Armed Forces? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have absolutely no tolerance for misconduct, Mr. Speaker. Our government brought in the Declaration of Victims' Rights. Our currently, we're, uh, we have Military Justice Fish uh, reviewing the military justice system. We actually have an independent panel currently on the systemic racism dealing with how to deal with systemic racism and gender bias, Mr. Speaker. We will continue this work. This is the work that we started as a government. We need to continue this so that we can prevent situations like this from happening at all. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, it takes incredible courage to come forward with a complaint about sexual misconduct. And that's exactly what a woman did in the Canadian Forces. And that complaint made it all the way to the desk of the Defence Minister who did nothing about it. That sends a message to all women in the Canadian forces that they will not be listened to and that they're not safe. That is wrong. This doesn't stop with the, with the defense minister. This goes all the way to the prime minister. What will the prime minister do to make sure women in the Canadian forces are safe? Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I disagree with the members' uh, assertions. Our government has, has absolutely no tolerance for this type of inappropriate uh, sexual uh, uh, behavior. As I've said, any allegation that was always brought forward were always taken to the appropriate authorities. No uh, politician, elected official, should ever be involved in any type of uh, elected uh, investigation. They should be done independently so that there is confidence in the process. And Mr. Speaker, we will always support those who come forward. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, on International Women's Day, we celebrate strong women who had the courage to break down walls and inspire future generations. The women in our Canadian Armed Forces deserve to serve alongside their male counterparts and to do so proudly. But when the Minister of Defence was made aware of serious allegations of sexual misconduct at the highest level, he did nothing. How will he repair the damage done? Honourable Minister. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we, first of all, I disagree with the member's assertions. There's a lot more work that, that needs to be done. But the, uh, the assertion that the member made um, is absolutely wrong. Um, Any time information that was brought forward is always taken to the appropriate authorities. But I do agree, agree with the member. A lot more work that needs to be done to root this out. This is going to take a significant effort, an effort that should have started a long time ago, way before our government uh, was elected, Mr. Speaker. But we're going to continue that work because we believe in it. We have to get this done, and we will. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, for three years, the Minister of Defence turned a blind eye to serious allegations against the former uh, Director of the Canadian Armed Forces. Now, another high up stands accused, while a whistleblower has received threats. No action was taken, and the abusive behaviour was allowed to continue. What will the Minister do now to ensure that the Canadian Armed Forces are completely free from harassment. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I completely agree with the member where we need to take action so we can have an inclusive environment, Mr. Speaker. We have done considerable work, but we have a lot more work to do. We actually got forward, uh, got past the Declaration of Victims' Rights Bill, which, by the way, Mr. Speaker, it died on the order paper uh, with the previous government. We have currently a review of the military justice system, how we can move forward. SMRC is also moving forward. We're currently looking at what type of independence need, needs to be provided. We have an independent panel on systemic racism and gender bias. I'm looking forward to those recommendations so that we can continue the progress that we have already started because our women deserve to have an inclusive place in the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. Deputy the Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, when faced with serious allegations of sexual misconduct within the top ranks of the Canadian Forces, the Prime Minister and this Defence Minister failed to act. And now a whistleblower has been threatened to secure his silence. Senior officers who may themselves be complicit remain in key positions within the chain of command. Victims and whistleblowers must be able to come forward without fear of reprisal. How will the Defence Minister protect victims and ensure that those who may stand accused won't interfere to protect themselves? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we want our survivors to come forward. We want them to be able to put forward the allegations. They will be heard. They will be protected. At no time did any staff member in my office ever speak with any of the callers. And any insinuation that any political staff ever reached out to the caller is absolutely false. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, people who have security clearances are thoroughly investigated for issues that might compromise them, like affairs, potential criminal behaviour and other actions that could open them up to external influence or blackmail. In 2018, the Ombudsman offered the Defence Minister evidence of sexual misconduct by his Chief of Defence Staff, but he refused it. Last week, he claimed he didn't know it existed, but clearly he did. His own staff flagged it. So did the minister tell the relevant security services that he knew of potentially compromising evidence against his own chief of defence staff? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I disagree with the assertions that the member has made. I disagree with the testimony that the former ombudsman has made. Any allegations were immediately taken forward, immediately, Mr. Speaker, to the appropriate authorities, in this case here, because it's a governor council appointment that we're talking about, to Privy Council, an immediate action was taken. In the former ombudsman's own testimony, the Privy Council office contacted him the very next day, Mr. Speaker. That's what action is about. We will always take this very seriously because we need to create an inclusive environment. That is exactly what our government and I have been working towards in the Canadian Armed Forces from day one. Thank you.
The Honourable Member for Lakeland. But the Minister himself is the top authority. And in security clearance vetting, people are asked about their families, about their previous jobs and previous addresses. They're asked about parallel relationships as code for extramarital affairs. Changing circumstances reports are issued for security purposes about divorces and financial transactions. The Minister knows all this, and security services need detailed information on everyone who has a clearance. So again, when the minister was made aware of evidence of sexual misconduct by his chief of defence staff, did he tell the security services? Yeah. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a former police officer and a former member of the Canadian Armed Forces, absolutely. First of all, know exactly where to go. That's exactly where we went to the Privy Council, who's in charge of Governor and Council appointments, to actually take a look at any uh, uh, type of allegations, Mr. Speaker. And I couldn't agree, agree more. But you also have to realize, Mr. Speaker, that the, the former Chief of Defence Staff was actually appointed by the previous government. So the, those are the things that we need to get to, to the bottom of. We will be looking at um, a, a review to take a look at what actually happened there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Lakeland. You know what's clear, Mr. Speaker, it's that these Liberals are all just talk. They're all just total hypocrites when it comes to listening and believing women. He had all the power and all the facts. He had the tools and it was his duty to investigate. The Ombudsman says after talking with him, the Minister cancelled seven meetings. His work was, quote, gutted hostile, toxic. He says there was a, quote, hit job, a cover-up to get rid of him, and months later he resigned in frustration. So why did these Liberals actually use all their tools to silence victims and force out a whistleblower to protect their buddies? Before going to the Minister, I just want to remind the Honourable Members that calling other members' names is not allowed, it's not parliamentary language. Just a reminder, and uh, I'm sure that uh, it'll sink in. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I stated earlier, I disagree with the former Ombudsman testimony, and I look forward to it. In fact, I welcome my opportunity to come speak at, um, uh, at the next committee meeting, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes to the, the, the horrible situation that some of our women have been forced into, as I stated, we want our survivors to come forward. They will be protected, but we have a lot more work to do, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to do this to make sure that we create an inclusive environment for everyone to be able to serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Lamiti Smatan Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago, the Prime Minister said that he was ironing out the details related to the mandatory quarantines in hotels. Well, that's an understatement. The situation is chaotic and even dangerous. The government was unable to ensure the safety of the people it's responsible for. It's such a problem that we've heard citizens saying they would rather pay the fine and suffer the consequences than go to the hotel under these conditions. Can the Prime Minister tell us how many people preferred to pay the fine than to take the hotel quarantine? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada has some of the strongest protective measures at the border to prevent the importation of COVID-19. We continue to work to add layers of protection to ensure that we understand who is, who is carrying the virus and how infections are entering the country. And indeed, as we see the rise of variants of concern, how the virus is shifting and shaping. We'll continue to ensure that uh, travellers are safe when they enter Canada and that Canadians are safe as well. The Honourable Member for Laurentie de la Belle. Mr. Speaker, there's still more mismanagement in the hotel quarantine saga. The rules that apply to traveling, uh, travelers arriving by air do not apply to those uh, arriving at our land borders. So what's happening? People fly to Burlington, get on a bus, cross the border, and circumvent the mandatory quarantine at the hotel. Mr. Speaker, the goal of these measures is supposed to be to limit non-essential travel, regardless of the method of transportation used. So why don't the same rules apply to all non-essential travelers? That would make sense, wouldn't it? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président, come. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague from the Bloc Québécois knows well, we have some of the strictest uh, measures in the world. When it there are, of course, the air traveler um, conditions, and there are also additional rules considering land travel. Now, would the Bloc Québécois prefer that there be no measure and that we stop controlling both air and land borders? Is that what I am to understand? The Honourable, Honourable Member for Manicouagan. 
Well, I don't understand, Mr. Speaker, because soon we'll learn that tourists are escaping, or rather circumventing the quarantine by passing by Roxham Road. The whole saga of quarantines is just pathetic. What we're asking the government to do was regulate the return of travelers at Christmas to prevent the entry of COVID variants. That was Christmas that we asked for that, but it's taken until February for them to act. And now the variants are already in our schools. Two weeks later, everyone had figured out how to get around the rules by crossing the land border rather than by air. How is it possible to drop the ball at every single step, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, it seems to me that the bloc is very happy about the fact that they had to ask so many questions at Christmas. They probably asked questions before then and after. That's their job. But during that time, we were taking action. We were implementing some of the strictest measures in the world at the border. Whether we're talking about air transportation or land transportation, because our goal was to protect all Canadians. It seems to me that perhaps the Bloc would prefer not to have such strict measures, but we want to have them. Don't in St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, the public has just learned that in February, a senior naval officer in the Canadian Armed Forces alerted the Liberal Defence Minister's office to an allegation of sexual misconduct against the Chief of the Defence Staff, Art MacDonald. In response, it is alleged he was told to report his concern elsewhere. Since then, the senior naval officer has received anonymous phone calls threatening his military career. Is the government investigating this shocking report of intimidation, and why is it that the defense minister is failing to protect whistleblowers and victims of sexual harassment in the Canadian Armed Forces? Is that not his duty, Mr. Speaker? Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, any allegations that were brought forward were immediately reported to the appropriate authorities. In this case, a complaint of misconduct was received by the switchboard immediately relayed to an official in the Department of National Defense. And at no time did any staff of my office speak with the caller and any insinuation that any political staff ever reached out to this caller is false. We want people to come forward, Mr. Speaker, that were presented to the appropriate authorities so that any allegations can be investigated. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Elgin Middlesex London. Mr. Speaker, in the last Parliament, the Status of Women Committee studied the treatment of women in the Canadian Armed Forces. Witnesses said their concerns were ignored and that after reporting sexual misconduct within the Canadian Armed Forces, they faced retaliation from their superiors. Women were passed over for promotions, and some even saw the reports being handled by those who were accused of misconduct in the first place. This government knew about issues occurring. Where was the action, and what has this government done to deal with these concerns? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I couldn't agree with the member more. More needs to be done in the Canadian Forces, and that's exactly what our government started doing. More importantly, we actually got the Declaration of Victim um, Rights Bill passed. And this was very important because it actually died on the order paper with the, with the previous government, uh, Mr. Speaker. We're also currently reviewing the military justice system by actually Justice Fish so that the changes we can look at to be more even responsive. We want to make sure we give survivors the opportunity to come forward so they can be heard, so that allegations can be investigated, uh, Mr. Speaker, and making sure that uh, no retributions could ever come on them as well. Thank you. Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Mr. Speaker, the Status of Women studied uh, in 2019 that the government implemented all 10 recommendations of the 2015 Deschamps Report, an external review of sexual misconduct and harassment in the Canadian Armed Forces. The Chief of Defence Staff responded by launching Operation Honour. But as we've seen, even the top ranks of our military remain plagued by sexual misconduct. How can Operation Honour be effective if the Minister of Defence ignores reports about sexual misconduct at the highest levels of the Armed Forces? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I completely disagree with the member's assertions. As I stated, the, I, will, um, I look forward to going to committee and I welcome my opportunity to, to speak there. We take every allegation uh, seriously, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, the great work that has been done by Dr. Preston within the SMRC, where our justice, uh, military justice is being currently reviewed as well. More importantly, we actually have an independent panel made up of former serving members um, that's going to review the systemic racism, including gender bias. So a lot more work that's going to happen. We have a lot more work to do. 
everything is currently on the table so that we can actually make these changes because this is the progress um, that we have started and we're gonna, not going to stop in, until we have inclusive. Well, member for London Fanshawe. On International Women's Day, it is important to acknowledge the fact that women who report sexual harassment and violence are often not listened to or taken seriously, making it hard for them to come forward. The Liberal government has proven through recent incidents that they are part of this problem. The Minister of National Defence refused to even hear allegations against a top member of our armed forces, and the Prime Minister's office knew about these allegations and did nothing. How can the Prime Minister expect women to be confident to come forward when they themselves refuse to show leadership? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I stated, I look forward to going to committee to set the record straight when it comes to uh, the, uh, the former Ombudsman's uh, uh, testimony. We do have a lot more work to do. The progress that has been made with um, having the uh, Declaration of Victims' Rights Bill, uh, a, a review of the military justice system. We are looking at other uh, opportunities where we can create greater in independence as well. We're going to build up on, on the work that we have done, Mr. Speaker. Um, a, a lot more work that needs to be done, a lot more review that needs to be done. We need to make sure that we work harder to create an inclusive environment for all Canadian Armed Forces members, especially women. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, last Thursday we heard very sad news that another Indigenous woman had been murdered in the city of Winnipeg. She was loved and cherished by her family, community and friends. I send my love and sympathies. Government inaction is costing the lives of women, girls, 2S LGBTQQIA individuals. Her life mattered and her life was of value. Mr. Speaker, how many more sisters have to be stolen before this government finally implements the 231 calls to justice of the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member um, for those comments, and I extend uh, our um, our deepest condolences to the family uh, of the uh, of the individual that the, the member had uh, referenced. Our hearts are with the survivors and families of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit and gender diverse people. In response to the first ever national public inquiry on the ongoing national tragedy, our government is working with all provincial and territorial governments, as well as Indigenous leaders, survivors, families to develop a national action plan that sets a clear roadmap to ensure that Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit and gender diverse people are safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Mr. Speaker, this International Women's Day comes after a long year of combating COVID. Women have been at the forefront of the pandemic's impact. And as we move forward towards recovery, can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Women and Gender Equality update this House on how the recent launch of the Feminist Response and Recovery Fund would provide support to essential organizations working at the front lines to ensure the safety and security of women? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague for advocacy and hard work on women's issues. Canada's recovery from this pandemic depends on ensuring that Canadian women are working and safe. The $100 million Feminist Recovery and Response Fund will support local, regional and national efforts to end violence against women and girls, improve their economic security and to increase their participation in decision making roles. Our government is investing in women's and equity seeking organizations because it's one of the best ways to advance gender equality. We have a strong track record of supporting the women's movement and we're continuing that support when they need it the most. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Skyview. Mr. Speaker, in 2015, then Chief of the Defence, General Vance, launched Operation Honour with the mandate to address and eliminate sexual misconduct within the military. Now we learn that allegations of sexual misconduct against General Vance were brought to the Minister's and Prime Minister's attention in 2018, and they actively chose to ignore it. Mr. Speaker, with today being International Women's Day, why should women place their trust in this Prime Minister when he deliberately ignores sexual misconduct within the military at the highest ranks? Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, as I've said, any allegations that were brought to our attention were always taken to the appropriate authorities who have absolutely no tolerance for this type of behavior. No elected official should ever be part of an investigation. In this very case here, um, after informing the former ombudsman was contacted by the Privy Council the very next day, so then an investigation could begin. There is no evidence that the ombudsman relayed this, uh, uh, re the original information, despite repeated follow-ups by senior officials. Mr. Speaker, we take this very seriously. Our governor is, has taken every step to making sure that we um, uh, uh, create a greater opportunity for women. And in the Canadian Armed Forces, we need to create an inclusive environment for all women in the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. Member for Calgary Skyview. Mr. Speaker, in 2018, at the Status of Women's Committee, the Minister said, quote, inappropriate sexual behaviour of any kind is completely unacceptable and will not be tolerated in the Canadian Armed Forces, end quote. Now we know that those were just words and nothing more. It is clear that this Prime Minister likes to say he stands up for women, but when it comes, actually comes down to standing up for women, this government frequently and consistently turns their back on women. Mr. Speaker, how many more women need to come forward before this Prime Minister takes sexual misconduct seriously? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we want all survivors to have the confidence to be able to come forward so they could be heard, so they could be um, protected to making sure that their allegations can be in, uh, investigated, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to actions of our government, Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons uh, from the previous government. Bill, Bill C-77, the Declaration of Victims' Rights, which actually died on the order paper by the previous government, Mr. Speaker, we passed it. Plus, we have SMRC currently right now provides 24-7 support to, uh, uh, to anyone um, and, and on these type of matters anywhere in the world. We will continue this work. We know that we have a lot more work to do, Mr. Speaker, but we will not stop the rest until we have a zero tolerance gate. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary Knows Hill. Today, Pfizer told Parliament that the original contract the Liberals signed with them had no vaccines scheduled to be delivered in Canada until sometime in 2021, even though other countries were receiving them in December of 2020. We also found out that it wasn't until late November and after the issue became a political hot potato that the Liberals went back to Pfizer to renegotiate. It appears the Liberals negotiated a position for Canada that had us at least two months behind other countries. Why? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, is the opposition upset that our government was able to accelerate vaccine deliveries? We received doses sooner and were among the first countries to begin vaccinations in December. Next, will we hear that they are upset that we are receiving an additional 1.5 million doses in March? earlier than planned to bring us to 8 million doses for this quarter. We'll keep bringing vaccines into this country for Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Well, Mr. Speaker, today Pfizer told Parliament that unlike other developed economies, the Liberals did not negotiate for December deliveries of vaccines in the original contracts. In fact, they didn't even bother to ask Pfizer for December deliveries until late November. This cost Canadian lives, jobs, and left our country more vulnerable to the spread of variants. Can the minister confirm what Pfizer said today, that the Liberals used tax dollars to pay a premium to get a photo op on a tarmac, only to be followed by months without the Pfizer vaccine? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I wish the Honourable Member a very happy International Women's Day. And I would also like to correct the record. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we were able to accelerate vaccine deliveries because of our strong relationship with Pfizer. And indeed, it was because of that relationship that they have committed to another 1.5 million doses in March and additional 3 million doses in Q to bring us up to 36.5 million doses for Canadians prior to the end of June and 117.9 million doses prior to the end of September. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Deputy de Shefford. Monsieur the Honourable Member for Shefford. Mr. Speaker, seniors are the most affected by the pandemic, but they are the ones who are least supported by the federal government. And it's even worse for women who are the most likely to live in poverty after 65. That is why the Bloc Québécois is demanding a $110 per month increase in the old age pension for those 65 and older. Would they thought for our mothers and grandmothers? 
Does this government recognize that this pandemic is difficult for seniors, especially women? Will it increase the pension? The Honorable Minister. My honourable colleague, for the question, what the block motion today fails to recognise is the full range of challenges that seniors face and that we have been supporting seniors with direct financial support and enhanced programmes. Our government recognises the pressures on older seniors and as seniors age, their financial security often decreases and their needs increase. That's why our government recognizes this need and will help address it by increasing old age security by 10% for seniors age 75 and up. We've taken significant actions to support seniors, especially during the COVID-19, and we'll always stand with seniors. The Deputy to Shefford. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Mr. Speaker, we don't need to increase the pension only from 75 up. We need to do it from 65 and up. Now, from out of all Canadians, seniors had the longest and strictest lockdown. They are the most affected by price increases and the virus, of course. And they are the ones most affected by isolation, which affects their mental health, but which also speeds the cognitive decline of the most fragile seniors. During the election campaign, the government promised to increase the old age pension. Its promise to seniors was already not enough, but now it's been reduced to nothing. When will this government finally increase the pension as of 65? Sure. Mr. Speaker, many Canadians have faced significant challenges due to COVID-19. And to support seniors, our government issued special one-time payments for those who receive OAS, GIS, and the GST credit. Altogether, we provided over $1,500 for a low-income senior couple, all tax-free. We'll continue to support seniors and all Canadians during this pandemic. We committed, we remain committed to increasing old age security by 10% for seniors age 75 and up. The Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, in March of 2018, the military ombudsman met with the Defence Minister to confidentially advise him of an allegation made against the head of the Canadian military. The Minister refused to look at the evidence and the meeting ended. The next day, the Prime Minister's Department asked the Ombudsman to divulge the details of the case. He refused to break his word and tendered his resignation. Three years later, the matter became public, yet the Minister feigned surprise. Who was the Minister trying to protect? Himself or the Prime Minister? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, no elected official should ever be part of an investigation. And that is why I immediately informed PCO, who's in charge of governor and council appointments, to take up this matter. And they immediately contacted the ombudsman, whose job it is to investigate allegations, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward to going to committee to testify there once again. Thank you. Well, member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Defence has been complicit in covering up allegations of sexual harassment against the former Chief of the Defence Staff. It is appalling that on International Women's Day 2021, our women in uniform are afraid to speak out against sexual misconduct and inappropriate behaviour, all under the watch of our feminist Prime Minister. What happened to honour? What happened to ministerial accountability? Will this minister take responsibility and admit to participating in this cover-up? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I stated, we have always taken every allegation seriously. No elected official should ever be part of an investigation. That is why immediately it was reported to the appropriate authorities, in this case here, Privy Council Office, who's in charge of governor and council appointments, so that they could follow up with the ombudsman, whose job it is to look at allegations, Mr. Speaker. And that's exactly what it was done. And I look forward to testifying at committee at the earliest opportunity. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, on the government's agenda for legislation in Parliament this week, we see their priorities include ensuring they can have an election, and ensuring that convicted criminals have it easier. What is missing is the Canada-UK trade deal, ensuring free trade with one of our most important and largest trading partners. The government missed one deadline already, having to sign a temporary agreement. The next deadline is just weeks away. What's the plan? Or will we need to sign a temporary, temporary agreement? The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to thank an honourable member for that uh, question. Uh, the Canada-UK Continuity Agreement, Trade Continuity Agreement, very proud of it. We have worked with the United Kingdom so that we can provide that predictability for Canadian exporters and for Canadian businesses. That is what they get right now with the continuity agreement. I'm looking forward to working with the, my honourable colleague and all members on all sides of the House to make sure that this important agreement uh, gets passed and continue to provide the tariff uh, reduction rates and that continuity that our businesses so uh, need at this time. Thank you. Honorable Deputy de the Honourable Member for Chateauguay-Lacolle. Mr. Speaker, when we asked Canadians to stay home to limit the spread of COVID-19, we recognized that home is not a safe place for everyone. Today, as we celebrate International Women's Day, it's important to recognize that the struggle continues. Can the Parliamentary Secretary for women and gender equality tell us how our government has supported victims and survivors of gender-based violence during COVID-19, specifically in the province of Quebec? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We have taken rapid measures to help women and children fleeing violence by providing up to $100 million to women's shelters and other organizations. In Quebec, we have provided more than $8 million for groups that provide shelters and other supports to women and victims of sexual assault. We have funded more than 200 Quebec organizations, like the Montreal Centre for the Victims of Sexual Assault and L'Auberge Matin. We want to end gender-based violence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, the minister said that international farm workers arriving on flights would be exempt from hotel quarantine until March 15th. But now we're hearing from farmers from the prairies and the Maritimes that the Liberal government is forcing workers to quarantine in Toronto hotels before proceeding to farms. Left hand, right hand, Mr. Speaker, as the largest number of farm workers are now set to arrive, will the minister do the right thing and give certainty about getting workers straight to their farms without delay? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the province's territories and indeed my ministerial colleagues for working so hard to ensure that we can uh, ensure the arrival of temporary foreign workers to uh, do their important work for Canadians in a safe manner. This is an all hands on deck uh, approach where we are making sure that temporary foreign workers have a safe place to quarantine, that they have uh, supports from the province's territories, indeed the farmers, and of course the federal government will continue that hard work, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Carleton Trail, Eagle Creek. Mr. Speaker, citizens across Canada, including constituents in my writing, have been writing me to express their horror at the Senate amendments to Bill C-7. Canadians affected with mental illness want hope, not death. Why is this government opening the door for their untimely death rather than providing legal protection and hope? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for her question. The Senate uh, reviewed the bill. It did its homework, uh, Mr. Speaker, by, pro by proposing very thoughtful amendments to the bill, and we have responded. Mr. Speaker, uh, mental illness is a, very serious, uh, is a very serious illness. It is an illness. It needs to be treated as an illness. It was always going to be looked at in the second stage of the bill, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to continue to do that, uh, but this time within the frame of the Senate amendment. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Richmond Centre. Mr. Speaker, today is International Women's Day, a day we should be celebrating the achievements of women across Canada. Instead, we read headlines about women being the victims of sexual assault in government-mandated quarantine facilities. When will this government reverse his practice of turning a blind eye on sexual assault? And when will they take steps to protect our vulnerable women in government-sanctioned quarantine facilities? Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, every woman de deserves to live a life free of violence and harassment. Our government takes these allegations very seriously. They are being fully investigated, Mr. Speaker, and we have put into place processes to ensure this doesn't happen again. The Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Uh, in happy International Women's Day. You know, from the beginning of COVID-19, our government has been doing everything we can to keep Canadians healthy, safe, and supported. However, many workers continue to face challenges in these uncertain times, particularly when they're laid off in the middle of a pandemic. Last week, I met with employees of Stanfield's garment factory here in Truro after they suddenly received layoff notices, and many of them are women who've worked there for decades. As their MP, I am very concerned. So could the Parliamentary Secretary for Employment, Workforce, to development and disability inclusion, please provide an update on our government's extension of EI benefits that will help hardworking Canadians like Mike. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to keeping Canadians safe and supported during the pandemic, and that's why we introduced Bill C-24, which extends the number of weeks available under EI regular benefits. With some workers beginning to exhaust their benefits in late March, this bill will ensure Canadians have the support that they need. We will be debating C-24 this afternoon, a straightforward bill all members have had since February 25th. I hope all parties recognize the allotted time for debate is sufficient and send this bill to committee for further study this week so we can get Canadians the support they need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Humanity is facing one of the biggest ethical issues of our time, ensuring equitable distribution of vaccines everywhere in the world. If we don't get this right, 30% more people will die, Canadians will be exposed to more dangerous variants, and our global economic recovery will be delayed by years. And now, when the world needs Canada to step up and support waiving intellectual property rights so that poor countries can access vaccines, the Liberals have sided with Big Pharma once again. Will this government vote to waive IP rules this week? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Honourable Member mentioned, equitable access to vaccines is a top priority for our government. And in fact, I'm really pleased to note that COVAX over the past couple of weeks has delivered millions of vaccines to dozens of countries in the developing world. It is a good news story that vaccines are being distributed right around the world. When it comes to intellectual property, Mr. Speaker, we have been very open to this conversation and have been open to hearing hearing from the proponents of this proposal since the very beginning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Terrible news. Another Indigenous person has been killed in the course of a wellness check. Another member of the Klaakut Nation, the same nation to which Chantal Moore belonged when she was killed by the Edmonston, New Brunswick police. The killing over the last weekend in February was on Mears Island on the traditional territory of the Indigenous people of the Klaakwet Nation. That nation issued a statement pointing out so tragically that there have been more members killed in wellness checks by police and RCMP than have died from COVID. When will the minister take responsibility? When will this government call an inquiry and end the threat that wellness checks propose to Canadians, Indigenous and non? Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, and I share the, the members' sadness and concern about this tragedy, and, and our thoughts are with the community, but Mr. Speaker, in situations such as this, it is absolutely essential that there be a timely, transparent, and independent investigation in order to provide answers to the many difficult questions that the people of that community quite rightfully have. We welcome and support the appointment of an Indigenous civilian monitor for the first time to help oversee that investigation, and he will have full access to the investigation. We'll continue to monitor this situation, and we're working with the RCMP and police right across the country to, to find a better response to these tragic situations and to help keep people safe. And that's all the time we have. C'est tout le temps que nous avons pour la période de questions aujourd'hui.